Without uh, much ado, I'll call on our Director General to, to come up uh, and we'll start the, the program on the agenda. So welcome to all of our colleagues uh, in the field. We're delighted and honored to have you here. Just a couple brief uh, words before we go into the agenda, the agenda itself. When I arrived here in, gosh, almost 10 years ago, in 2008, I imposed upon you and this organization something known in New England as the town hall meeting, when the town gathers. And we're kind of like a big town or big village or family. And the idea was uh, something that I began to use when I first became an ambassador in 1979. 40 years ago, or, and I've continued to use it as a means of strengthening internal communication. I'm afraid that we've tended to set the agenda from the executive office uh, rather than getting, getting input from you, and I don't know whether you or we are to blame for that, but if, it's, if this continues, it should be then improved. But here we have, I think, averaged about once every four months. Could have done it more often. We did do it more often when it was required, when you had a crisis, that particularly important then. So I hope that you found these town hall meetings useful. In any case, this will be the last town hall meeting that will be held during my mandate. Uh, and I look forward to a good discussion today. So I think we should go to the first agenda item, which is the uh, update on the global compact on migration. So I think we have a bit of a slide program, which I will speak to. Um, so, okay. First of all, let us say that we warmly welcome in IOM the completion of the negotiations on the Global Compact uh, for safe, orderly, and regular migration in New York on the 13th of July this year. This brought to an end largely uh, 2017 uh, consultations and a stock taking exercise in Mexico. Uh, it brought to an end negotiations between February and July. Uh, and so I wanted to say that we should all welcome this and it will be our responsibility now to make it work. I particularly would like to commend the permanent representatives in New York to the UN from both Mexico and Switzerland. They did a terrific job under difficult and challenging circumstances, but also commend the special representative of the Secretary General for International Migration, Ms. Louise Arbour, who a lot of you will remember from her time here as the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, I want to remind everyone that this text did take quite a while to uh, to happen, and it will be presented for adoption at an intergovernmental conference to be held at Marrakesh, Morocco, uh, in on the 10th to the 11th of December, uh, being convened at the highest political level, preceded by, or followed by, I don't remember which, preceded by, the Global Forum on Migration and Development. I was joking with the Moroccan ambassador the other night at a nice dinner that he did for my wife and myself. Uh, that uh, they planned it perfectly so you, the weekend you can spend all your money in the souk, the wonderful <laughs> souks in, in, in Marrakesh. Uh, so let me say two things about this, and I'll use words that I don't like to use because they're threadbare. First of all, this is a truly historic accomplishment. It's also remarkable. It's historic because it's the first time ever that the heads of state have come together at the United Nations General Assembly to agree to negotiate a, anything on migration. And this is a very important one. Secondly, it's remarkable because these two co-facilitators and the special representative were able to negotiate in the middle of a very poisonous atmosphere. When have you last heard something good about migrants recently? They're deciding elections and determining the makeup of coalitions. So this is really remarkable. Therefore, we have to give it our best. It recognizes that we all have a shared responsibility 
for people on the move. It's an opportunity to improve the governance of my, am I tracking okay? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> to improve the governance of migration uh, uh, at an international and domestic level. It helps us to draw the benefits of migrants and migration for all of our countries and our, and our peoples. Um, the compact doesn't encourage migration and it doesn't aim to stop it. Migration is as old as humankind. People have always been on the move. They always will be on the move. And so we don't have to encourage it. It happens naturally. And we don't want to try to stop it either. We do want to reduce the number of people who are forced to migrate. Um, it fully respects the sovereignty of countries. Uh, and it is not legally binding. Therefore, we're going to have to have some kind of a review process to make sure that we are, in fact, leading up to the serious commitments that we made. It will be a blueprint for how states can really best manage or govern migration. Uh, it, and it gives plenty of space and flexibility to countries uh, to do so on the basis of how they assess their own migration realities and capacities and how they assess their own national interests. Um, it's got 23 objectives, a 360 degree approach, and it's basically aimed at making human mobility a choice and not a necessity. But the momentum has to be maintained, and we will be helping with that in the days ahead. It's going to be a very quick start uh, on the 1st of October. Um, so we're starting preparing now for implementation of the Global Compact. Um, we hope that governments uh, will come to Marrakesh with their own ideas, their own uh, concrete suggestions, examples of good practices, as well as pledges and commitments. So we'll do all this in the spirit of partnership, and our message today is partnership and cooperation <coughs> at all levels. Um, Secretary General of the United Nations has given IOM a very uh, important responsibility and a very important uh, task and, and, and uh, opportunity by naming us to be the coordinator for the Global Compact on Migration and also to be the Secretariat. So that brings me then to the point of the UN Migration Network, which the Secretary General I think it was first established it on 23 May of this year. It, I mean, you can say, if you will, it replaces the global migration group, but that would be a disservice to the network. It goes, it goes well beyond the GMG because the GMG was largely a disappointment, if not, uh, I won't call it a failure, it was a disappointment, let's leave it at that. And so this is, this is good. Um, there's going to be a preliminary meeting of a small number of agencies, essentially uh, those, I think, who signed the New York, or the New York Declaration Group. They'll meet here uh, in, uh, on the uh, 15th and 16th of October at what's called a framing conference. Uh, it'll gather around 30 UN agencies and departments, uh, and it will be based here in Geneva, which is good because it moves migration it migrates migration back to Geneva because it needs to get out of political New York and back to humanitarian Geneva. So that's kind of the way it's going to, it's going to happen. And there will be an informal group of 22 agencies uh, working on migration, which is the GMG, which will cease to exist in October because essentially there aren't that many agencies who really have a genuine interest in migration. So the establishment of the network will give us... Uh, unprecedented opportunity in the international community to strengthen cooperation on migration. Uh, it'll bring us in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and I think it's going to be a major, major opportunity and a major risk for us. And I will say a bit later when I have an opportunity that I leave, I will basically very, very reassured about your future. But there are some, some underlying concerns, and one is how are we going to do the Global Compact 
at the same time maintain our operational projectized nature. We have to bring that together in a manner that both moves uh, this organization forward while maintaining its essential characteristics, but also allows us to show within the UN that we can take leadership on this question and that we will use it to weave ourselves into the fabric of this very complicated uh, UN system. So I think I've said too much already. I should probably sit down now. Is that the idea? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I'm going to turn it over to Michael. I'll give you the floor. Uh, I want to highlight just a few things uh, that uh, we've been working on uh, in the course of 2018 um, and start with uh, a, a very important development which happened in July, which was the launch of the new competency framework. Now, those of you who take any sort of interest in human resources know that uh, the competency framework is the bedrock of what we do in human resources. And you'll see a number of... Um, uh, new tools that are aligned to this coming out in the course of 2019. Uh, we also have launched, or are about to launch, a number of very, very important policies. Um, there's one on internship coming out, one on the use of retirees, one on performance management coming. And um, there's also, uh, we hope, uh, a bit of a rethink of rotation. Now, that doesn't mean that the rotation system will change dramatically, but it means that we're looking at um, how it can be improved and how it can better serve the, the interests of the organisation. There's also some exciting developments uh, from a system perspective, a, a UN system perspective. One of these is the launch of the, um, the activities of the duty of care task force as a system saying we need to do a better job of looking after our staff and particularly our staff in deep field duty stations. And uh, during the course of 2019, our role in human resources and as chiefs of missions and as, as leaders in the organisation is to realise these recommendations so that we do, uh, are, we're very serious about having a duty of care for our staff. Now, inextricably linked with that is also another interagency task force on mental health. And again, this is a, a, an area that is woefully under-resourced and under-recognised in the UN system. At one point, it uh, was uh, estimated that around one-third of UN staff will, at some point in their life, suffer from one of four identifiable mental health issues. And that's a pretty high figure, and yet, as a system, we are we're very under-equipped to deal with that. We, as in IOM, Anna and myself, uh, had the opportunity to brief the Secretary General last week and his senior management group. He was very excited about it and uh, we now have been invited onto the board to make sure that um, the recommendations that come out of that strategy are implemented uh, during the course of 2019 and, and beyond. So that's, that's exciting. Now, um, there's also a, a few things on the horizon. I mean, when you come back into an organisation after six years, you look at things through a little bit of a different lens and I've had the privilege to be able to do that. And uh, I'd like to just detail a couple of priorities that I see for 2019. One is I think we need to have a look at our recruitment processes and practices and make sure that they, they uh, find the right balance between transparency, objectivity, but also agility as well. I think um, that uh, we will be asking everybody around the world to have their input into that. One thing I'm very keen on is for people to tell me what it is to be an IOMer. What is it to, to work for IOM? What is it about IOM that gets in your blood, that's in your DNA? And I, wanna, I want that passion to come out because I want that to be reflected in the people strategy going forward. We also will be continuing to roll out uh, the Unified Staff Rules and Regulations. We've done 111 countries already. Uh, we'll probably do another 25 or so during the course of 2019, and that will leave us 20 or so countries to do going forward in 2020. Um, there's also, uh, uh, I think, uh, a renewed emphasis on genuine succession planning, and particularly for the core positions that are important for this organisation. And by core positions, uh, I mean the chiefs of missions, the RMOs, and other positions that are geographically replicable. And um, I hope during the course of the next 
uh, three months to table an initiative that will be a, 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 pretty, a pretty important initiative in terms of identifying and unearthing talent in IOM at the margins of the workforce. Um, just to finish off with, um, uh, we also are rolling out EVE, which is the Entitlement Validation Engine. Uh, that doesn't sound very exciting for most people in the room, but it actually, in terms of having um, a, a HR architecture where we can mitigate against risk, etc., that's very important, and that will go ahead during the large part of, of 2019. So we're excited about that as well. Now, I know there's time for questions at the end of the presentations, and in my experience, uh, most of the questions tend to relate to human resources. Um, so I'll, I'll be on standby to answer any of those questions. Thank you, everybody. Do you want to come back and say some words before we show a... We have a... We also have a little surprise after your, your words. Okay. Uh -huh. Before we close. We've had too many surprises in our life, but anyway. Um, please let me know if you, if you cannot hear me. Please tell me. Um, <laughs> is that better? Okay. I think the, those of you who know me know that I generally like to make three points, and I haven't done that. Um, and you also recall that I like alliteration. Uh, when my wife and I and were sitting in uh, Malaysia between the election and the 1st of October, uh, I had a lot of time to think. I knew nothing about migration, still don't know that much, but I came up with the thought of the three P's, which you know by heart now, professionalism, but I thought we could probably do more in this area, and grateful to HR because they've done a lot on the training side there and the various department heads have brought RTSs and others back, specialists, uh, to get to know one another better and to build their expertise. We had another one called Partnerships, and again, I think you all have done a terrific job in increasing the number of partners we have. Uh, it'd be even more important now with the Global Compact, so I would hope that we keep pushing to get more partnerships. And the third was something I call proprietorship, which basically meant member state ownership of the organization. And it's frankly uh, due to that that we got the two committees, the IOM Budget Reform Committee that got us a three-year budget increase, 4% each year. We have to go back to it now and say we need another one. Uh, but it also is thanks to the commission that the member states themselves created that we're now members of the UN. This is not my doing. You all gave it a lot of support. It's basically was well, a member state decision. I also, after my re-election in 2013, I gave you the three C's. Continuity, because so much of what we do is exactly right, exactly what we should be doing. We need to continue it. There's also the LC was coherence, and that becomes even more important now that we're in the UN, to be coherently working within the system. And the Global Compact will make that very clear. And then the third one was change. And I've tried to make as little change as possible in the, since the election of, the, of the, the new Director General, because I think I should leave that to him to give him a clean slate from which to start. Today I have very, very briefly three A's. The first one is appreciation. I know uh, I was very heavily criticized at the beginning because I was traveling too much. And I thought about it long and hard, and I said, look, if we have 14,000 people in nearly 500 places around the world, how can I sit in beautiful Geneva and do my job? And so I've continued to spend about 50 to 60 percent of my time on the road, so to speak. But I. Even the list today of the 21 missions who joined us, there's six I've never been to. So, did, did one of my many shortcomings. Um, but I, I always, when I go to these posts, the first thing I do is ask for a town hall meeting to thank everyone, 
to thank you today, all of you here gathered in headquarters, all of you in the 21 missions, and well beyond for the work that you do every day. When I was a candidate, I would go around and call on IM offices. I couldn't understand it. People are so enthusiastic. They're working so hard. They're not getting rich. They're doing okay. But they're not getting rich. And I realized after I came to IOM, it was the importance of the issues, the richness of the narrative that kept people working. When I was a peacekeeping mission in the Congo, we had uh, 17,000 troops, 5,000 police, a couple thousand, I'm sorry, 5,000 civilians and 2,000 police. And I was still in my last days there after five years, still recovering little nooks and crannies where people were working away with no supervision, doing a good job. So it's inspirational to me. And I wanted to, first of all, use this occasion, our last time all meeting, to thank everyone. If I haven't been able to say it to you personally, thank you, thank you, thank you for all your service. I'm very, very proud of all of you. Um, we will, um, I must also say to, pardon me for the personal reference, but I want to thank most especially my wife, Huey. She has been the, sort of I could say, the, the wind beneath my sails. She's, uh, she's also brought me back down to earth. <laughs> done this in partnership and she's put up with all sorts of crazy things. I wanted to go off and do peacekeeping for a decade to the Sahara, then to the Congo, and she put it up, put it with me for seven years, you know, seeing it once or twice a year. So I owe her a great uh, debt of gratitude. My second point is with achievements, and I can't get very, I, I can't speak very long on this subject because the list is far too long. But you have done amazing things in these 10 years. Um, achievements uh, in every aspect of migration. Uh, and there are many more to come. The growth of the organization. We've now gone from, what, 8,000 maybe to 14,000 counting our consultants and contractors. We have expanded the membership from about 125 to 172, and you will go on to get universal membership, uh, maybe beyond 193. We're only 21 shy now. Um, we have uh, the record of having the most, the highest percentage of people in the field of any other UN agency, which is, I think, fantastic. That's the way we want to keep it, because. It is in the field that the work really gets done. We are here to support the field, not the other way around. According to the director of ICP, who I asked to research it for me, we're about number five or six in terms of staff among the UN agencies, of which are about, I think, 44 at last count. We are about number eight or nine in terms of budget. We would have been hired this year except for reductions in the refugee program. We would hit the two million mark for the first time. And we are number one in, the, in terms of percentage of staff in the field. We are older than somewhere between a half and two thirds of UN agencies, 1951. Um, so uh, that's something we can be proud of. Uh, the Global Compact is, I think, an achievement for which IOM can at least take some credit. <coughs> And we built this up over the years with the various regional consulting processes, of which are about 23 now. We've helped build it up through the Burn Initiative, through the International Dialogue on Migration, uh, and other things that has brought us to this point, that people had a foundation on which to establish um, the Global Compact. Emergencies and crises, we're managing probably a dozen. 
from West Africa to the Bay of Bengal, uh, and doing it uh, very professionally. Dozen armed conflicts, natural disasters, public health outbreaks, what you all did for Ebola. I sent uh, 150 to 200 people to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea without any extra insurance. And Ebola is a killer. So you may just proud again. And there's so many others. And I'm sorry I, I didn't get your favorite or particular achievements that you want me to talk about. But I wanted to give some illustrations. It would take us too long. And the innovations. The IMCOF, the MIGOF, the MIGAP, the Global Film Festival, all sorts of things, and you all continue. You've got really very good innovators. And then the third, I guess, under, under uh, appreciation, I could also have said apologies, because I really do <laughs> regret my shortcomings and my failures, which some of which will be discovered only by the new administration, unfortunately. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's, I guess it's in the nature of being human, and I apologize for something. And I also, as I got older, I became more lazy. I used to have something which I used all my career called M MBWA, Management by Walking Around. I don't do much of that anymore. I don't do lunches. I don't do receptions. And like I, we did so many as ambassador that we kind of got out of that. But my third point would be aspirations. Uh, I hope you'll continue to take an aspirational approach to your work, that there's a lot more out there that can be done. So how do we wed together the management of the Global Compact and protecting our essential characteristics and our operational ability and our projectized nature? In that regard, how do we, how do we maintain IOM's familial atmosphere? How do we integrate ourselves into the UN in the most effective way, uh, keeping our operational capacity and projectized nature? At the same time, how do we begin to increase core funding? We don't have much walking around money for special occasions. How do we get to universal membership? How do we strengthen the nexus between humanitarian work and development? Um, and then, of course, the challenge that really awaits us is trying to help governments to change the negative migration narrative, how to get serious about the challenge of inexorably growing cultural, ethnic, religious, and linguistic diversity, and how do we begin to address the demographic challenge that is upon us. Um, so in conclusion, I always think of uh, departures and opening your chapters. Uh, it's like running a relay race. You run your lap. You try to pass the baton without dropping it. Or it's like actors on a stage. You're, you're actors on a stage for a short while. You do what you can. You hope somebody will. Did, 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 did you play a good Hamlet, a terrible Hamlet, or more importantly, does anybody even remember you played Hamlet? <laughs> so, with that, oh, those over the long remarks, let me sit down and thank you again for all you've done. And let's, uh, let's uh, have a glass afterwards to thank everybody. Thank you. I want to share with you this little surprise to say thank you. And it's a collective effort. So I think if we can go ahead and enjoy it. On behalf of IOM Turkey, I'd like to thank you for unwavering support and encouragement which made us one of the largest missions in IOM. We love you still. All the best from Ukraine and Russia for Bashania Ukraine. On behalf of IOM Somalia, thank you. Oriva Didi. We were proud to receive you and Mrs. Swing at IOM Sri Lanka and Maldives and be assured that as we continue on this migration journey, your wisdom will stay with us. He's leaving us with three honorable elves. As a legendary director general, his lasting legacy 
The third L is he's leaving with love from all of us. From all of us here in IOM London, we will miss you. BG Swing, thank you for everything. Thank you for your leadership, guidance, and support over the years. We're going to miss you very much, but I want you to know that you will always be welcome here. Hi, Team! Three points. Hydration is vital. Visionary and valued by our DG. Thank you, On behalf of IOM IED, uh, we wish you a best of luck and uh, great retirement. Thank you so much for your service. With your advice and IOM, I am breaking barriers in Bangladesh. Thanks. Four, four, two, up, down, you are the best. Warm wishes. I am no way. <laughs> best wishes from Australia. Buenas suerte. Conchas. Sesame. Nangway pagpalain ka. Hambani ka ke. Cheers, man. Trustworthy. Proactive. Dedicated, unstoppable, inspiring, kind. Ah, DG. Le, le, le. Le, le. On behalf of IOM in Indonesia, from Immigration Liaison Office, Jakarta, Jayapura District, from IOM Dalit Sub Office, from Surabaya, from Tangerang, from IOM Tajung Pinang, from What will remain with me most is the DG's commitment to the idea of service and that we have a debt of gratitude for our privileged positions as officials of my women. 1,100 staff members will continue your legacy. Happy retirement! Best of luck as you migrate into retirement! Woo! We would like to thank you for your leadership and experience, hard work, your support, generosity, your vision, charisma, for your kindness, your patience. Thank you for all your support during these years and particularly for leading by example. From my own Argentina, our best wishes for the future. Your team in Azerbaijan would like to thank you for your continuous encouragement over the years. Thanks to your leadership qualities, I have earned greater than ever respect in the country. for being our Director General for the last 10 years. We have seen a lot of expansion in humanitarian engagement and also PCEA. A lesser man would not have steadied the ship as ably as you have done. Thank you for your service, sir, and all the best. Your leadership and your energy have been an inspiration for all of us. Your 10 years term really raised the bar in the leadership of IOM. From IOM in Mexico, we wish you the best in all your future endeavors. I am Egypt and the MENA region thank you for your support. Caloroso saludo de la República Dominicana. 
todo el equipo de la OIM. Gracias por todo. We hope you will enjoy the pleasures Free Time can offer. We list them under the letter F for easy memory. Family, friends, squash, Fernando! Namaste! Thank you for everything you've done. We wish you all best blessings and we hope you can visit Nepal one day. We will miss you! If you need to sing from my heart, It has been a rewarding experience working under your leadership all these years. We wish you all the best and we hope to maintain a warm friendship. Thank you, farewell, and warmest wishes from the IOM team in San Malta. Thank you for the earthquake response, for visiting us in Habitat 3, and for all the selfies. IOM today stands taller and sees further because it stands on the shoulders of the giant. During your visits, you were able to provide concrete recommendations in a way that will support the best interests of migrants and maintain their humanity. You have inspired us. You have transmitted your vision and paved the way on how to help those in real need. Thank you! We were very impressed by your energy and friendship, having overnight flight from Japan and being ready for all-day meetings. Good luck in all your future endeavors. You are a role model for all of us. You truly inspired us. Miss Mr. Mr. Sui, we will miss you. Thank you for your dedication over the many years and wish you all the best. انتهز هذه الفرصة لتقدم بالتحية والتقدير لسيد ولم سوين بلير عن منظمة الهجرة على دعمه وجود الموصول لدعم كتاب منظمة في لبنان Thank you DG for all this year Your impeccable work ethics and your outstanding results will forever inspire the future generations of IOMers From all of us in Tirana, Albania Thank you We thank you for 10 amazing and fruitful years. All best wishes. Thank you. thank you! On behalf of Mac and all the staff, bon continuation. Thank you for 10 memorable years of visionary leadership and transformation. Best wishes for the future! IOM's work in supporting IDPs, refugees and migrants in crisis context has increased tremendously under your tenure. Thank you for 10 years of your leadership, guidance and support. I wish you and you and all the best for the future. It was an absolutely amazing experience working with you. You will always be a great role model for me. One of the greatest director generals of IOM and a great friend, a true gentleman, a great human being. Good luck, Bill, with your well-earned retirement.